Plants that look cool and are easy to care for. Those are just a couple advantages of using succulents in your planters and gardens. We'll have more on the water storing vegetation and a whole lot of valuable gardening information for you straight ahead. Every tree has a moment when it shines. That's called money wart or creeping jenny. You can go in and do a rejuvenating pruning. Forage and feed for our native pollinator population. A garden really gives you peace of mind. Hi, welcome to Great Gardening. I'm Pamela Fish, and I'm joined by two great guys who also happen to be specialists in all things gardening. They are Bob Olin, horticulturist and educator with St. Louis County Extension, and Tom Casper, president of Duluth Garden Flower Society, also on the Duluth Community Garden Program Board. Uh, well, weather-wise, it's been a really great week, hasn't yeah. it? What have, you, what have you guys seen growing out there? Bob had to drag me in for this show. <laughs> yeah, for this show. It <laughs> would be nice to be, to be outside, outside right now. But, um, but, you know, for gardeners, this is great stuff. A little different than last year. Yeah. Uh, we need a little water. Uh, that's going to be the next key element, sure. I think. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Although we're talking about succulents tonight, we really don't want this to turn into a semi-arid area here. <laughs> <laughs> right. The succulents don't need them as much, but um, we probably should be out watering some of our perennials and trees right now? Uh, I yeah. think so. Uh, okay. You know, observe heavier soils. There's plenty of moisture there, but if you have lighter soils, for sure. And if you, we want to do some direct seeding under lighter soils, you're going to need some moisture to get that seed germinating. The soil's pretty dry right now. Okay. Yeah, and we're, and we're, we're seeing some evergreens burning up right now. Yeah. So if folks have those and they're starting to change color, get them some water. Get them some water. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll talk about a lot of uh, other uh, things, but we have to welcome our St. Louis County Master Gardener volunteers right now. There they are, a nice group of them standing by to answer your called-in questions. You can reach them at 218 788-2844 or 877-307-8762 or you can email your questions to askgardening at wdse.org. Well, tonight we're talking about a very popular group of plants, the succulents. And we begin with those that you most often see indoors, the holiday cactus. We uh, have some pictures and some examples. So, this Bob, is great. take us through these. It's a classic Thanksgiving cactus. Take a look at that, see the points on the leaves, truncata, that, that's characteristic of the Thanksgiving group. Also, multicolors uh, from tangerine to uh, magentas to pinks, uh, that's characteristic of the Thanksgiving group. All right, and then the Christmas cactus, which everybody's familiar with, but you know, some, some people probably didn't know there was a, a Thanksgiving and an Easter, but tell us a little yeah. bit about the Christmas one. This one blooms obviously just a little bit later. Now it doesn't actually necessarily hit the end of December, but it's a little bit later than the Thanksgiving cactus. Note again on the leaves that the, the leaves are rounder. These aren't leaves, by the way. These are flattened stems, but the stems, again, are, are more round, and you don't have those real sharp, distinct points to them. And this favorite of mine, this is the Easter cactus. Some of these are blooming right now, and they have this characteristic of uh, the bloom opens during the day under bright light, and it shuts down at night, and the blooms are really quite spectacular. Once again, the flattened stems are rounder in nature and they're not pointed. You know, they all came, there's no such thing as a house plant. They all came from the, uh, the natural environment and they naturally grow, believe it or not, in uh, tropical areas, in, in rainforests. They grow high in the plant, in the trees, and so they're getting curtain filtered light. Mm -hmm. So light is the key to making these bloom. Get them light while they're, they're growing during the growing season. And Thanksgiving and Christmas, they bloom as the days shorten and Easter blooms as the days get longer. And we want uh, again bright light and uh, good growing conditions but uh, here's some examples too as well. This Easter one is really beautiful that you, that you brought in uh, planted with the jade plant there. Um, I admit I, I don't know that I've seen one of those before. You know they're, they're less common and I'm not mm -hmm. exactly sure why but uh, they, they bloom beautifully. You can see the blooms right now this time of year and uh, these are all real easy to grow. You know, to bring them into bloom, sometimes a little tricky. You want bright light when they're green, right mm -hmm. now when they're growing, and then you want to trigger the bloom by uh, decreased temperatures at night and watching the amount of light that they get. Follow can, the natural daylight. Can they go outside in the summer? You know, they really can, and, but you always want to put them in the deep shade. You really okay. don't want to put them uh, out in the direct sunlight or they'll turn kind of a reddish color and you destroy some of the chlorophyll. All right. So they like filtered 
bright light. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, here's uh, something pretty cool. We got a couple pictures from Nancy Eaton. She sent a photograph of her great-grandmother from the 1930s seated beside her blooming Christmas cactus. And that same plant still blooms for Nancy. In fact, uh, here it is blooming last Christmas. And uh, Nancy says she thinks it's about 100 years old. So thanks for sending that in. That's great. That's amazing. I think a lot of these do become heirlooms. The one I have here is about 50 years old. Wow. So it's really surprising. They really uh, do well. They do well under low light conditions. And with a little uh, bit of abuse, they don't take a lot of real intense care. So okay. they're, they're great houseplants. And, and certainly easy to divide and share um, with friends or or in plant sales or whatever it happens Just propagate to be, so. them, you guys told me before, just by breaking off a piece and putting it in a Yeah, some kind of a rooting media. Yep. Stay okay. away from any fertility until you get a root system there, but they're pretty easy to propagate. Okay. Yes. Well, there is a really wide diversity of succulents, and they're used in all sorts of plantings. So here now is more on varieties and their care. A succulent is a plant which stores water in its thick, waxy leaves. And succulents are loved, both for their unique look and ease of care. Many new and interesting varieties, now found locally, are grown as annuals and can continue to thrive indoors during the winter months. But there are perennial succulents that do well in our climate, namely the Semper Vivum, or hens and chicks, which will winter over well and propagate in most area zones. Sedum is another succulent that thrives in Northland gardens, and creeping sedums, more commonly known as stone crop, are among the most versatile and easy to grow. Succulents prefer bright light, but can adapt to light shade. In pots, they need a fast draining soil mix. In the ground, make sure it's a well-drained site. And don't plant them too deep. They generally have shallow roots that form a dense mat just under the surface of the soil. As mentioned, they have real shallow roots, and that's because why, Bob? Well, they, they never have had access to a lot of moisture, so they're mm -hmm. going to have shallow roots, and that's why they've got these moisture-conserving stems and leaves. They, they really, uh, so they're easy to <coughs> transplant, they're easy to move around, and uh, they're best suited for areas where you don't really have a lot of real high quality soil. They'll grow well under a lot of adverse conditions. So. We touched on this, but Maria from Duluth wants to know how do you get a Christmas cactus to bloom? Hers goes out in the s summer and in the fall. It's probably the number one question that I get. Uh, there are several keys. First, you don't want to transplant. They like to be, they like to be grown real tight. Uh, get them outside if you like, curtain filtered, and then make sure they get plenty of light. And then when you bring them back in, you want to make sure that they don't get any more than the natural day length and then you want differential in temperature between your day temperatures and your <coughs> evening temperatures. 65 during the day, drop it all the way down to about 50 at night. So if you do that combination of things, uh, they'll bloom for you and bloom consistently. And, right. <coughs> excuse me, and don't over fertilize them either. Okay. Uh, they don't like a lot mm -hmm. of fertility. So. All right. Slow growers, yes. All right. Well, Nancy from ESCO says, uh, what's the secret, or asks, What's the secret to growing sweet pea flowers? Well, lots of light. They really like a lot of sunshine and really should put six, seven, eight, ten feet of growth on for us in most summers. So getting them in, in a good sunlight condition, but really waiting till after there's any chance of frost. They're very susceptible to cold, so make sure it's a nice, warm, sunny spot. All right. Nancy also wants to know uh, of a good idea for plant markers. I know I've seen people use small stones that they use, uh, that they paint with permanent paint on. You guys, what do you use? I wish I had an answer for that yeah, because I've tried tough. like uh, all kinds of things and they <laughs> always end up in the compost pile. <laughs> um, okay. So I think paint on rocks is nice and mm -hmm. I've seen people use sections of Venetian blind that they've mm -hmm. cut up and used yeah. as markers, but it really is a challenge for those with lots of plants in their mm -hmm. garden to, to, uh, to make sure they know which ones are which. Because so. they get okay. switched around. I think if you want to go to the trouble, em embossed aluminum tags tend to be the best and most permanent, yeah. with a, a big stake in the ground if you're going to, going to have any kind of stake, uh, because they do tend to shift a little bit. Good question, though. It's a yeah. challenge for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Mary Alice from Pequon Lake is looking for a soil mixture used in Japanese moss balls or kokidama. 
And I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. I looked it up on YouTube, and they have a, a, a cool uh, demo of that. But they didn't really talk about what to use. She said she's heard cocoa peat, mineral deposit, bonsai soil is good. It's basically a ball that you, you, you form, and then you put the moss around it and secure it with a plant inside. Yep. So, yeah, and I think a good, well-drained, almost like, a, uh, like an African violet kind of soil that's very light in nature will work good for something like that. So. Okay. Gregor has a seven-year-old pear tree. The bark was chewed off some branches near the central leader, um, and some branches were encircled, some just the top half. The trunk is fine. What uh, could that be? He's wondering about mice, maybe? You know, it depends. It's, if it's up near the central leader, and the mice don't climb, basically, so mm. it's right down at the base. We didn't Thank get goodness. A, uh, <laughs> Thank goodness, <laughs> right. Be thankful for little things. Huh? <laughs> I would suspect the rabbits uh, up on the snow, uh, snowshoe hare, particularly a seven-year-old uh, uh, mice and voles will attack younger trees, but when you get real tough bark, seven years old, it, generally it's a snowshoe hare that's doing the damage. Okay, all right, well, get rid of that rabbit. Um, Jennifer from Cloquet has an ivory silk lilac tree that looked dead last year. It did get a couple of leaves, and she says this spring it has buds on two suckers that are coming up from the dead tree. So what to do there? Uh, <laughs> that's that's going to be tough. I mean, yeah. she basically is starting over. And uh, the winter that we had a couple of years ago continues to wreak havoc on some of our plant material, um, even going into this year. So she has a couple of choices. She can cut down the dead part, mm -hmm. let it start over, or remove it completely and plant something new. But uh, um, either will be a challenge and, and either an expense in time or uh, financial to replace it, so. Okay. Uh, Bill from Tower asks, what is the best treatment for spruce bud worm? Mm, spruce bud worm, which attacks spruce, but it also attacks balsam, uh, even to a greater extent. Uh, it's really tough, it's a natural pest and uh, short of, um, you know, uh, an insecticidal treatment, uh, I don't think we really have any good answers on that. It can be devastating. If you have a high value tree, you might have to consider some type of a, some type of a control. Okay. Well, good luck with that one. Um, Rich from, I think, Foxboro has cucumbers. What's a good, or is wondering about cucumbers, a good variety and has been growing straight eights, but wants a change. Oh, he <laughs> Good for him. get a change. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here, the quick thing, you're always going to see straight eight because it's, it's what we call a line cultivar where they put the seed in the ground, they grow the plant, they, they get the uh, fruit, and they just strip the seed. There's no hybridization involved at all. Uh, so it's very cheap to make. Consequently, there's good profit in it. You're always going to see it there. But the informed gardener will go with something with what we call a disease package. And there are any number of them out there that are really pretty good. The Market More series got good disease resistance. Mm -hmm. That's the downside of, uh, of straight eight. No disease resistance. Um, but straight eight, Speedway, Dasher 2, Market More 76, Market More 86, they're all first generation, nice disease packages, a little bit more expensive, but uh, you'll get a, a much, much better performance and, and much higher yields out of those. Lots of good cukes to choose from Lots out there. Lots to pick from. All right. Well, we'll have more questions coming up later. But now we want to take you on our weekly garden tour where the homeowner has a real flair for arrangements, many using succulents. Hi, I'm Shelley Pedersen, and I live in Smithville. Welcome to my gardens. About 26 years I've been at, at this house, and I've gardened all my adult life. I love it. And you know, basically, I just, I don't go for symmetry, I just plant. And you know, however it works out, that's, I don't have a whole, a whole huge plan when it comes to, to the flower placement. And this garden just keeps getting bigger. I, just, I added that tree on the end. It's a willow type tree. Um, and that is the bush variety over there in my neighbor's yard. And it doesn't get very big, you know, so it's an ornamental tree. You know, we share, you know, in the neighborhood. A lot of the neighbors in the area are, you know, turned into gardeners. So more time, on the, you know, to be able to do that. And it's, it's just been fun. You know, I always do that mandevilla there, you know, because my planters usually I switch them up every year. I don't do the same thing every year. It's just one of those things I put it in there and see how it would go. <laughs> you know, I'm not afraid to cut, you know, bushes, whatever, you know, and, and reshape and so 
You know, some can be done in the spring, some can be done in the fall, depending on if they're blooming. After it's done blooming, I just trim it to try to manage the size. And that other bush is a bush variety, Japanese lilac bush. So I do the same to that. Really um, fragrant, too. Well, basically, I wanted to grow vegetables, but I didn't want to weed. So I bought these big pots. So a variety of tomatoes and cucumbers and beans and peas are over there and squash. This little cu cucumber plant here, I'll get like a dozen cucumbers off of there. It's amazing. And the interesting thing too is, is just that there's a lot of succulents that bloom in almost all of them in there are you know blooming plants you know not just green i just lay landscape fabric inside you know the for some of the planters so that it doesn't leak out all the dirt that you know that when you water it runs out and it catches all that i put potting soil in you know drilled in a hole a couple holes for drainage potting soil and planted the plants some succulents and lobelia and then i put just a fine uh, colored rock on top and um, I brought it in last winter so I, I was able to have uh, save some of these larger plants and then just planted a new grass this this spring you know this is just something I have loved my whole life my mom and my sisters and we're just kind of a gardening family yeah Shelley just did wonderful things uh, just as she said, just by planting them and see what happens. Yeah, <laughs> and, a, and a great neighborhood for gardening out yeah. where she lives. I mean, lots of, of good gardeners there that are do nice things. And, and she mentioned about her succulents that we're talking about mm -hmm. tonight and that's some wonderful examples of what you can do. So. And, and the blooming ones, you know, people might not know that so many succulents bloom, but uh, they really are gorgeous. Yeah. I, lo I love the moss rose myself. Yeah. And you saw all those in the real shallow containers. You get mm -hmm. a nice advantage of succulents. It doesn't really take a lot of yeah. um, soil, and, and they grow really pretty well. Mm -hmm. And maybe as warm as it is, we might all be growing succulents <laughs> soon. <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll see about that, Bob. <laughs> Let's get through some questions um, that are still coming in. Nancy from Two Harbors prepped the gardens with cedar mulch. There was some mold. Uh, she's wondering about grain fertilizer freezing. Um, I'm not mm, granular okay. fertilizer freezing. So the, the mulch and the cedar I can take, you know, okay. she may want to lighten that up. It might be too thick. Mm. Um, but certainly cultivating it will sort of release that and it should be okay. So. Um, not a big deal if it, I mean, it's going to naturally sort of break down on its own anyway, so. Okay. And on the granular fertilizer, I think what she means, uh, will it freeze? Uh, anything that has a nitrogen component actually kind of clumps together. It, it's hydroscopic. It, it takes in the relative humidity of the air, so you get big chunks of it, and you lose some of the nitrogen back to the air. So if you're going to keep fertilizer over the season, you want to take that package, and you want to be sure it's in good heavy poly and twisted tight so you keep as much air away from it as you can then it's just fine. Okay, Jerry from Duluth planted a four-year-old river birch last spring and watered it well. There are no buds on it yet. Is it uh, late to bud or is it too dry maybe? Well river birch are notoriously late. Um, there's years here in Duluth where we don't see those even bud out till early June. Uh, depending on where he lives. It sounds like he lives in Lakeside, so um, not to worry yet. And if he is concerned, he can take out a pocket knife if he wants and just take a stem uh, or small branch and just do a tiny little scrape. It should still be green. It's not going to hurt it. Mm -hmm. uh, take a look, but more than likely it's okay. River birch, generally pretty hardy. Yeah, good tree, um, yeah. hardy, okay. very attractive. Great. It'll be okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Peter from Duluth, what is the control for Missouri fruit fly on raspberries? He noticed uh, white larva on the fruit last summer. Is that one, uh, is that a? Yeah, we, it's one of several insect pests. Uh, you know, we really don't have good controls. I wish I had a biological I could okay. recommend. Uh, part of it is small patches uh, separated from various places. If you, if you see insect larvae, insect eggs, anything like that, you want to physically remove them. A homeowner can certainly do that, but uh, we've got, 
We've got some pests, uh, insect pests on small fruit that uh, can become very troublesome. And we did talk about them last year. And, uh, the Drysophila, which is, mm -hmm. is a major, major concern. One of the issues, even if you were to elect to use pesticides, they all have waiting periods and they usually attack the fruit right at its peak of ripeness, so mm. you really don't have any opportunity. Darn bugs. <laughs> <laughs> right. So a good wash yeah. <laughs> prior to eating and would I, be a good I thing. I tell True. people they're just out there trying to make a living like everybody else. <laughs> they want a good meal. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Linda from Moose Lake wants to know, how should I prune my vanilla strawberry hydrangea? Well, uh, and we've talked about hydrangeas a couple times. Good thing for, for her to just kind of wait, allow it to bud out, and then look for any dead tips uh, that she has, and then go back and kind of prune those out slowly, take it down um, just above the, the new growth that's coming out and kind of clean up those tips. Um, okay. And really kind of right now or coming, into that part of the season. Because so. hydrangea is so unique because they bloom on old wood, they bloom on new wood, and what you had to say there was excellent advice. Just take a close look and you can tell whether or not you've got buds or not. And prune back anything instead, yeah. let everything else grow out. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, here's one from, I think it's Watersmeet, Michigan. It's uh, Her name is Judy, and I think this is leftover from the home show, but she planted peas indoors under lights, got one inch long, and then they turned brown and split. Was one. Um, wondering what might have happened there. About one inch long and then the plant split. Yeah. Mm. Well, um, obviously, you know, it, it could have been a, a soil issue, it could have been a light issue, it could have been a humidity issue. They're cool, a cool crop that really doesn't like the intensity of those fluorescence. You've got a ballast above the fluorescence and it could be that that was a, that was a part of it. Uh, that may be causing that. There also are some uh, diseases that they're quite vulnerable to. Mm. So she'd want to start with a good soil mix and she'd want to try to keep it as cool as she possibly could, looking for a cool location. All right, Judy from Michigan has one more question. Do you need to let city water stand before using it on plants? It's not a bad idea to do that, especially um, depending on where you live. Um, some of the pHs on some uh, municipal waters can be quite high and certainly letting it stand and and some of the fluoride's gonna come out of it as well as it stands, so um, good thing to do that with uh, much of the water, so. Okay, good, good to know. Uh, Gregor from Brule started some different lettuce seeds indoors. They were four day to germination. The stems got thin, they're not standing up, about a half, one and a half inches long. So can something be done with those? Well, or should something be done with those? You know, you've got, you've got a growing tip there, so you're not gonna give them a haircut like you might an onion plant that's getting a little unruly because you can't really cut into that growing tip because it'll unfold from the center. Uh -huh. You can always uh, prune off those leaves that are on the uh, outside area and then again it's a question of cool bright light is what he's really looking for there. Mm -hmm. Okay great. Uh, let's see Edward from Duluth wants to know what can he add to the soil for good root crops? Well, <clears throat> certainly lots of good compost is going to help and, and lightening that soil up as much as he can to allow those roots to develop. So, You know, we are going to talk on root crops in a couple shows too. If, it's, if his right. root crop, which is actually stem, if it's potatoes he's interested in, uh, potassium is the key there. Mm -hmm. And then just a balance, as you said, for, for the rest of them really. And thanks for mentioning, in a couple of weeks, we will do a, an entire show on root crops, so we'll have more on that. Mm -hmm. So thanks, that was great information. We got a lot of questions in, but right now we want to share with you some favorite photos sent in by area gardeners. From Carlene Blair of International Falls, proof that you can plant hen and chicks just about anywhere, in an old chicken feeder or the top of a milk can among gears and gadgets, in a miniature garden setting, or arranged with a Tonka loader in a very small-scale construction site. These individual blooms were singled out by Rihanna Betterman, who took the pictures in the garden of her grandfather, Duane, who grows the vibrant blossoms in Superior. This snapshot catches the work of Duluth Community Garden Director Jan Hibbs transplanting her tomato plants. And guess who sowed kohlrabi seedlings into the garden this past weekend? Our own Tom Casper. Can't wait to see what he cooks up with the results. Share some of your favorite garden pictures by emailing them to greatgardening at wdse.org or send them to the address shown on your screen 
and let us show what you grow. Tom, I was so pleased to see you growing yeah. kohlrabi, and I'm looking for some recipes. Can't wait. Yeah, well, I love kohlrabi with ranch dressing. There's my <laughs> recipe. <laughs> oh, um, and, and this is real dirt underneath these <laughs> okay. fingers. So. All right, all right. Well, we just have time for maybe one more question, and Linda in the Three Lakes area was having trouble growing radishes. She says that uh, she had success with peas, beans, other veggies, used a mix of peat moss, compost, and vermiculite, but the radishes wouldn't come up. Any ideas about that? You know, we always start with the simplest thing first, make sure the seed is viable, take a couple sheets of a uh, uh, paper towel and get them wet, make sure they germinate. If that's the case, out of what she mentioned there, mm -hmm. that's the only one that's a crucifer. So, and they are vulnerable to soil borne disease. So if everything else is the same, I would go back. Uh, it's likely that she should switch out her soil one way or another. Oh. Uh, it may well be that, uh, that she has a soil borne fungi that's, that's attacking the seed just as it's germinating. Okay. And, and a great point about making sure she's got viable seed. That's Oftentimes people thing. carry that over and it just loses its germination sure. rate, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good advice. Thanks, you guys. Well, we want to take a look at a uh, couple of things coming up. Swanson's Greenhouses, that's just south of Eveleth, and uh, one of our underwriters, they're having their 30th spring open house. It's coming up this weekend, Saturday and Sunday. You can go online. There's their website and get all the details about that. Great people, just right on Highway 53. Yeah. You can't miss them here between here and the range. They have a lot of nice stuff up time, there. Yes. And uh, also, there's a link on our website to a sale that's going on with the Duluth Community Garden Program. That's right. They have their fruit tree and shrub sale coming up starting this weekend at uh, the Duluth Farmer's Market. All right. Thanks so much. Well, that's all our time this week. Next time, we look at a variety of garden sheds and their uses. Thank you so much, Bob Olin and Tom Casper, for excellent advice and insights. As always, a big thank you to our phone volunteers from St. Louis County Master Gardeners. From all of us here, thanks for watching and enjoy the garden.